Hi everyone and welcome to the Allied Air Force webinar for April. Uh, I would be obliged if you would turn off your cameras and your sound until the presentation is over. It just helps to keep the, the background noise to a minimum so that everyone can enjoy the event and hopefully it will stop any screens freezing or any delays as well. Please pop a note into the chat box and tell us where you're watching from today. And for anyone watching via YouTube, hello, <laughs> hope you're doing good. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Claire Wilson and I will be your host this evening. I'm a professional genealogist for Treehouse Genealogy and I also run the Allied Air Force Research website where I work as a, a researcher and an aviation historian. Got more both people coming in. So I was born into the RAF family and my own interest in the topic stemmed from researching many of my own Air Force relatives, which I suspect you know, was the same route that, that some of you took as well. During this year, we have an amazing range of speakers for you. You can find out more about the talks via the website and just shortly I will post a link into the chat box so that you can check that out. If you take a moment to subscribe on the website, we will also send you an email by return with details of where you can register for all of the events that are taking part this year, that are taking up. I've got a bit of a cold and I'm <coughs> catching myself up. Um, yeah, if you subscribe, um, we will send you an email and you can register for all the events that are taking um, part this year. Um, I have an amazing relationship with Pen and Sword Books, and as you know, we have been interviewing some of their aviation authors. They stock an outstanding range of aviation books, and I will post a link into the chat box um, where you can check these out for yourself. Tonight's pre-recorded interview is with John Sweetman, and it's regarding his book, The Dam Busters, Was It Worthwhile? Um, I loved chatting to John. He was a lovely gentleman and I really was totally astounded, um, as I'm sure you will be when you watch it, at some of the people that he actually met. Um, so remember to hang on for that interview in the second half. If you're on Facebook, check out the Allied Air Force Research uh, Facebook group. It's an amazing place to chat about what you're researching, get second opinions, and also meet like-minded people and I'll place a link in the chat box for that as well. As I said, I've got a bit of a cold tonight, so I'm hoping that my voice will, will hold out for, for the whole event. Um, so our speaker this evening is Dave Nelson. Dave has been researching B-17s, <clears throat> the 390th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force and their base at RAF Framlington on and off since the 1980s. He renewed his interest after returning to college and attaining a degree in history. Since then, he has conducted extensive archival research on the operational and logistical aspects of the group. Tonight, he will be presenting the story of the base, home to about 3,000 young men, some facing the jarring horrors of combat, while others the routine slog of daily routine. How did they train? How did they work and live? And what were their days like? Dave, how are you? Oh. I am now unmuted. <laughs> how are you this evening? Thank you so much for agreeing to do the presentation for us tonight. Thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you to everybody who, uh, who zoomed in. Yeah, so um, I'll hand over to you, Dave, if you want to share your screen, and I'll get started. Okay. Is it doing it? Maybe just a bit of a delay, not yet. Well, I swear it worked a minute ago. It did. We did try it before we came on. <laughs> ah, here we go. All right. That's it, Dave. There we go. Okay. Well, my my basic background is that um, 
I first encountered a B-17 and fell in love at first sight. Um, just everything about it, the, the, the deco detail, the, the power of the engines. A lot of people say that the radial engine leaks oil everywhere it goes. As far as I'm concerned, it's simply marking its territory. Um, RAF Framlingham. I got hooked up with that because uh, this group is blessed with not just one, but two museums. And I was um, uh, a reenactor in, in, back in the time when I was the appropriate age in the 80s. And uh, was actually working with Sentimental Journey, which is one of the few examples that's still flyable today. Um, on a visit to its base, I went down to the Pima Air Museum in Tucson and encountered a museum there with a B-17, and it was the 390th. Um, when I had the opportunity to come over in 89, uh, I had the opportunity to, well, I made sure I had the opportunity to get over to the actual field and see the, uh, what, was, what was still remaining, substantially more than exists <clears throat> now. Um, but at any rate, um, let me show you what the city, the, uh, field looks like at this point. Uh, if you can see, right there is the 390th, and it's surrounded by all of these other fields. Uh, and these are simply the American 8th Air Force ones. It's not even all the 9th Air Force ones. Um, but that's what exists now. This is a current ordnance survey map, and you can see the outline of it. Um, this is a 1945 map, and it does not show it. It shows the road that was taken out, but of course you didn't want to publish all of your airfields in a 1945 map. It's an unusual city, and it was like a company town of old. And I put the Children's Crusade in there, and I'll explain why. This is what that same area looked like in 1904. These are the field maps. This is the uh, road that was falsely showing on the 1945 map, and that's taken out uh, due to the airfield. It began uh, construction in the summer, let's see, May of 1942. There were two companies involved, Constable and Hart and Haymills Limited. And they began pouring the concrete in June of 1942 that necessitated removing eight miles of hedgerow and 1,500 trees. It cost uh, approximately a million pounds in 1943 which today would be 58 million or $70 million. It was allegedly ready in May of 1943. And this is what it looked like uh, actually in 1944. Uh, the first group that moved there was the 95th bomb group. And uh, they took possession of it in May and flew, I believe it was nine missions and they were so problematic because uh, the base wasn't really ready. A lot of the buildings weren't complete. A lot of the buildings were not hooked up electrically and the water didn't work. But other than that, it was good to go. So the 95th moved to nearby Horem and the 390th was delayed uh, and they arrived in July of 43. The reason I call it the Children's Crusade is the commanding officer of the 3,000 uh, allied personnel was 34 years old. Um, many of the flight crew and many of the ground crew had only joined um, 
in the year prior and had very little experience and were generally aged around 24. Um, and to me, that's amazing. Uh, so here's a, a plat of the, uh, of the base. We'll run around a little, come up some of the details here. Uh, obviously, these are the main runways. There's a perimeter track that's a little over three miles. Um, these spots are where they park the aircraft. I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with uh, British Bomber Command. I am not. Um, all of the buildings are RAF design, uh, Air Ministry. Um, and it's set up so that things are uh, dispersed in such a way that um, uh, an attack on the field would be defensible and would not damage all the aircraft or uh, cause mass casualties. Uh, the site numbers here are from the, the record site plan, but they use different ones uh, just to complicate my life. And here's the classic illustration that it's not simply my appraisal that it's the Children's Crusade. This is Bill Malden's uh, Willie and Joe cartoon from during the war and his editorial comment about the rapid rate of promotion. You may not be familiar with the insignia, but this private infantryman, dog face, whatever you want to call him, uh, is the uncle of a Army Air Force colonel. And um, the relationship of Uncle Willie is indicative of uh, the rapid rate of promotion. This is another little hint, it's Children's Crusade. Um, this is called Roscoe Ann. She is a, an American black bear from Montana. And she was brought along uh, by somebody who didn't really have a great deal of executive uh, uh, functioning <laughs> because this little, little black bear turned into a great big black bear um, and had been transported over and caused enough mayhem in the uh, nearby villages that um, he was eventually put down. And that's, I think that's tragic, but Roscoe Ann uh, led to uh, great deal of hijinks and the squadron insignia for the 569th. The main industry of this corporate town was to destroy and all activities were geared towards supporting the mission. This, however, is the one example where they were not destroying anything. Uh, this is called a Chowhound mission. Uh, if anybody's familiar with that, but um, there was a negotiated uh, treaty that most people don't know about in uh, the Netherlands at the beginning of May of 45 was still German occupied. The, the problem was that uh, the, the Dutch people were in fact starving. And so there are no bombs in this picture. The, the bomb bays are full of uh, boxes of food and they were, they were dropped on five chowhound missions uh, before the end of the war. But their general mission was to destroy. And here you see uh, Osnabrück uh, getting some severe urban remodeling. Uh, city government. Not particularly a democracy, but more of a democracy than you might think. The, uh, uh, the base had 3,000 people, and we think of it as a single base or a bomb group. It's not. It's uh, 15 different organizations 
uh, here's the, the headquarters, the nerve site, and it's nestled in between buildings of civilian buildings. And here's the uh, bomb site storage area, very close to headquarters as it was top secret Norton bomb site storage site. This is the organization. This is as it was in June of 44. It was constantly under uh, revision and uh, started off without a radar section, started off with um, a different um, service uh, system, started out with a service squadron that turned into a sub depot. Clubs were added. Um, it got more refined, but this is um, how all 15, 16 organizations uh, blended together. 16 if you count the veterinary detail. Okay, so we all know that, that uh, uh, the combat experience of the air was by definition a schizophrenic existence in that um, the extreme and high casualty rates were felt amongst the um, air crews, but most of the ground crew was there for the duration. Uh, so these air crew would go out and have these experiences and come home and sleep in a bed, uh, go to a club, and go off base, go to London. And it was a very surreal experience. The part that intrigued me is, my, well, my great uncle was actually with the Ninth Air Force and uh, his photo album uh, includes two pages of uh, aircraft and the rest of it's his regular job. He stayed on the ground and uh, it was, well, it wasn't quite a nine to five. It was uh, episodic and um, a lot of physical labor, loading and unloading things. This is the technical site. The technical site, there were actually two of them. The other one's a little smaller and it's uh, off to the right hand side. But uh, the technical site has the hangar where in actuality you could only realistically work on a couple of aircraft at a time. So only the most seriously damaged uh, or seriously in, in, in need of repair would go in there. Engine changes, uh, wing changes um, and of course all the electrical work would happen out on the flight line on these uh, this is a, a frying pan hard stand and uh, later fields didn't use as many of these they used the uh, loop hard stands you could put several aircraft on here at one time and um, uh, unlike the, uh, the chain of uh, frying pan, uh, one uh, damage to a taxiway would not hinder uh, other aircraft getting in and out. Uh, this is where the primary work of the ground people was. This is a crude model of it. Actually, this is the communal site. They had uh, three dining areas. Uh, this is a, a gym. These are showers. That's a latrine. And this is where um, the station complement squadron was based. And this, I, very strangely, is a squash court. All right, supporting industries. Um, 
obviously the main is the, the combat troops and um, everything was centered around them. There was a there was a combat mess specifically set up nutritionally so that um, the effects of high altitude flight unpressurized was not going to, to hurt the air crew and that they would they would have different availability and that they would have meals when it was appropriate for people that had gone on on uh, the mission they're either very early for breakfast or very late for dinner um but the su direct support was the people on the line the maintenance people and uh technicians that kept the aircraft going and serviced them. Here you can see a couple of um, very small details that are very important. This is a fueling site, and uh, they would they would um, have seventy two thousand gallons in one here. And another one again dispersed so that one hit wouldn't uh, wouldn't put both out of action. Another one back here by this other hangar, and uh, seventy two thousand gallons of uh, storage was basically enough for uh, an all hands long distance mission. And maximum effort by the summer of summer and fall of forty four was uh, uh, definitely 36, but sometimes up to 48 as they would form composite groups. So they would have 48 aircraft go, each aircraft carrying 2,700 and, uh, change in fuel. Uh, and that's that was the capacity. So things were coming in and out all the time. Uh, But without the people on the ground, nothing would happen. Uh, this is sort of an illustration of a, uh, uh, the engine buildup shop, which is in the main workshops. And uh, they, they showed up every day, did their job, and, and did everything that they could. Generally, they were working 12 hour shifts, six days a week. Uh, but of course, maximum effort meant you worked when you needed to. School. Uh, when air crew had shown up, pilots or bombardiers or navigators, um, they would have about a year in service. Uh, navigators and bombardiers a little bit less. Um, but a lot of the people on the ground, <clears throat> mechanics included, uh, would have gotten a, a uh, six to eight week basic training. And then depending upon the specialty, mechanics get about six months. So, um, and a lot of that's generalized because you don't know what kind of aircraft you're going to be assigned to. So there were a number of school opportunities. It was um, it was um, set up so that there were link trainers, uh, which I, again I don't know if the RAF used. Uh, there were three of them in. Um, in one building, there were turret trainers, so you could practice your gunnery. There was a, a bombing trainer, which I know the RAF had because it's an RAF building. Um, and ingenious. Um, and that's that's one of the things that draws me to, to, to learn about the, the ground school, uh, forces because they didn't have, um, they had the needs that we have today, but they didn't have obviously any sort of computing capacity. So their synthetic trainers were ingenious. Um, how they would uh, uh, 
move a projection of a map over the ground and link that up so that uh, uh, they could simulate bombing runs is just ingenious. Um, how they got uh, all of the, the components uh, to function, these, these 15 organizations, uh, was through po pooling of personnel. And none of this school, uh, none of this, this training is, is set up in the tables of organization. So this is an impromptu um, uh, organization within an impromptu organization. The affiliated businesses, well, it's even further back. Supply was a major issue at the beginning. Uh, mud was a major issue at the beginning. Uh, and there was nobody assigned for building utility maintenance. It was um, all set up on the fly. And um, uh, I find that absolutely amazing. And I, I well, I'll, I'll get to the, my observation about that at the end. Recreations and diversions. Well, the cliche is that they went to hang out at the pub. Um, and there was some of that, uh, especially the, the permanent staff would uh, frequent pubs uh, using uh, bicycles getting to and from, and they would do that. Let's see, Framlingham's about 10 miles. No, it's less than that. It's more like seven, eight miles from, uh, from the base. Uh, and that was about the radius. So uh, they would frequent pubs uh, either close to closest to their workstation or, or their their quarters, um, and they'd have leave to go uh, outside of their regular working hours. And that's a different concept than uh, the leave to London or the, the recovery periods at flack houses. Uh, but on the base itself, I pointed out the squash court. Um, they had their own impromptu um, baseball fields, uh, track and field, competitive uh, shooting for skeet. Um, they did not have too much in the way of football at this base, but um, they certainly did uh, search their their groups for uh, uh, musicians. They were handed out uh, sporting goods, sport equipment, uh, and had leagues. And uh, all the bases would uh, put up teams. And there were division champions and eight Air Force champion. And uh, when we were vi visiting there in uh, 2019, uh, they had found a trophy uh, for the 8th Air Force uh, baseball team that they had fielded. And um, um, go Framling. Um, they also had mission parties. The group did 300 missions, and they they had uh, fairly well organized and funded uh, 100, 200, and 300 mission parties. Of course, the 300 mission was also victory. Um, and there were uh, they they would turn the uh, the hangers into um, uh, dance sites. And, and set up for bands, but they also had regular weekend dances uh, where they would uh, uh, get uh, women from the area and chaperones 
and uh, hold them at one of the many clubs. They had clubs for, uh, again, a stratified military. Um, one was called the Rocker Club. And if you've seen American Sergeant's insignias, they have the three stripes going up and the rockers is what they called the, the marks underneath. And um, if you had one, two or three rockers, you could go to the rocker club. Obviously the officer's club was attached to the officer's mess and everybody else went to the Red, Cor Red Cross Club, the Arrow Club. Um, and at the Red Cross Club, um, there was a restaurant, there were game rooms, there were reading rooms, uh, and that's how people managed to keep their, their uh, sanity as they stayed there for the duration. Um, okay and then i've got this illustration of where most of the clubs were uh this is the consolidated mess that's where everybody who wasn't combat crew or an officer ate this is the combat mess, and this is the officer's mess, which is still extant. Um, and the squash court and the commanding officers' buildings are still there too. Up until about uh, 10 years ago, the um, large water tower was still existing. And uh, I remember that from 89, but uh, of course it's been gone for a while now. All right, so uh, how did uh, policing work, fire, and ambulance? There were organizations where these were their missions. There was the 1143rd MP Company, military police, and that had about 130 people uh, affiliated with it. They had an uh, engineer firefighting platoon where they had only one piece of actual apparatus, um, but three trailers were, uh, were allotted to it to uh, hook the regular trucks. Uh, and they, they could pump 500 gallons per minute. Scattered around the field, actually, since they didn't have fire hydrants, they had um, uh, water ponds that um, uh, 30 feet by 30 feet that they would draft the water from if they had a fire and they did have fires. They weren't just crash and rescue. Uh, and the, the ambulance or like the A&E uh, would be the 272nd medical detachment, which was based at a station sick quarters where again, just like so many other services, these 15 different organizations would pool their all their medical personnel and have them work at the station sick quarters. Okay, what challenges? Well, obviously they were a military base at war and they did have, um, they, had to, they had to be prepared to defend the base. There was a battle station, battle headquarters that uh, was located on the technical site. Uh, eight machine gun pits that salvaged bits and pieces of um, uh, aircraft armament, uh, as well as their own uh, internal uh, weapons. <coughs> a communication system to um, uh, alert the troops and um, uh, that's obviously the, 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 the most threatening uh, is being attacked and that did happen uh, especially kicked up uh, 
when the V1s started kicking up and the noodle bugs would fly over the field. Uh, the closest one that actually landed uh, on the base was uh, near the bomb dump and uh, it caused no casualties. But uh, snoopers would come in uh, following formations, especially late day missions. And uh, had, had some successes, uh, at least one that I know of, uh, attacking an aircraft as it was coming into land. So they really were in a combat situation. Most of the time, though, it, the biggest problem was we had 3,000 very young Americans that were a long way from home. Um, at the summer of 44, let's see, I got that number here somewhere. The summer of 44, there were uh, 67 crews, which would be uh, at that point, they, they had dropped down to nine. So about 600 air crew and 2,400 on the ground. Um, towards the, the winter of 44, 45, um, morale on the ground started to get uh, a little bad. Um, the weather was extraordinarily cold. And what they thought was the, the absolute end of the Reich uh, turned out to not be true. And when the Battle of the Bulge started, um, a lot of these guys were very disappointed. And a small number of them actually were drafted from um, their bases uh, with the Army Air Forces to become infantrymen. Uh, so that's the, the, the life, the risk to life and limb was the number one problem for um, the air crews, uh, especially in that uh, schizophrenic existence of uh, safety, comfort, and extreme risk. Uh, but the endless monotony of it, six days a week, uh, working shift work, working extra hours, um, caused a fair number of people to uh, get sick and misbehave. The number one misbehaving was speeding and, and uh, but insubordination did start to rear its head in the winter of 44, 45. Uh, this is a plane that uh, took off and could not gain altitude. Uh, and it, it crashed in the, in the village. It took out the Methodist church and nearly killed uh, a couple of kids. Uh, but there are plenty of examples of bases where planes exploded, bomb loads exploded, bomb dumps exploded. Uh, and the other hazard for the, uh, the villagers is that uh, they're outside the, the, the range of the defensive machine guns and they knew they, they were a target. It's a love-hate relationship. This is the village of Parham. This is the model I made. Uh, the cat that was in the background, there's one of its hairs. Uh, the village of Parham, there was no dividing line. There was no fence. This is uh, the chemical area on the north side of the field. And there's farms literally that go up onto the field. And those will work during the war because agriculture was a vital commodity. The legacy of the city. It's a love-hate situation. 
And by that, I mean there were um, great relationships forged and uh, that continue to this day. Um, there were marriages. Uh, this particular group had about 3,000 people permanently as the station. And uh, there were about 60 marriages. Uh, likely there were uh, other offspring from it. Uh, there was also uh, damage done to crops, trees, animals, uh, and uh, obviously from that 1904 map, there were a great deal of changes. Uh, outside of that, there were also uh, crimes that were committed by these boisterous young lads. Um, but there was also that relationship of mutual respect where when people discovered the mechanics of the 458 sub depot that did the higher level maintenance uh, or repairs rather, um, they, they encountered a World War I vet. As you saw, the buildings are uh, almost intermingled. Well, they are intermingled with um, uh, the military buildings. Um, they encountered a World War I vet who, because of uh, restrictions from the war, um, were unable to, to, he was unable to uh, get a replacement wheelchair from injuries sustained during the Great War. And uh, the mechanics encountered uh, this gentleman and made a dis decision that they would build him a replacement wheelchair. And uh, uh, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a touching story, but it's also it's one of those stories about uh, uh, hearts and minds. I'm sorry, I'm old enough now that uh, the cynicism is easy. Um, but it is touching. And so with all of the chaos that was going on, the mud at the beginning, the lack of supplies, the lack of replacement parts to the, to the, uh, the big buildup in 44, where they went from like 30 some odd planes to 70. Um, it's touching to know how the relationship worked and how it all managed to work out okay. Uh, the field after the war uh, was used for uh, repatriating Polish refugees. And then following that, uh, it was returned back to the farms. Um, as you saw from that um, uh, initial map of today, the, uh, the only thing left is uh, a ghostly image, but it's going to serve as a reminder well into the future about how this relationship worked and how we succeeded. I'd be happy to answer any questions. That was amazing, Dave. <clears throat> it really does make you think, you know, it, it pretty much was a village or a, a city where they're in there on their own. Um, and so far away from home. And such um, a cold winter. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it. Um, I, I mean, where do you think you know, the, the Commonwealth forces, you know, you've got the Canadians and, and, and the Australians and they're all in with the British. So, I mean, where they were away from home, sometimes, you know, a lot of them would go and visit family with some of the British guys while they were on leave. You know, the Americans seem to have been very much secluded. 
when you look at it that way? Well, it was a very hospitable place. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I noticed actually Maureen had put a note, so we've got, we've got quite a few people watching tonight. We've got Virginia, some, um, some watchers from uh, England and Scotland. Um, and I noticed that Maureen has said she's a 20 minute drive from Parham Airfield. <laughs> so just down the road. Just down the road. Yeah. Someday soon. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Alan has said, very interesting presentation that has clearly been thoroughly researched. Great to get an insight into the United States Air Force operations at Framlington. All those models um, must have taken a lot of time and dedication to thank you. Yeah, I mean, so how did you build the models? Did you did you get aerial footage and then? Build yes, I, I've got. Um... Uh, between the Germans, the Americans, and the British, I have five sets of aerial photographs and um, uh, topographic maps and all the ordnance survey ones. The I, I I scaled them all so that they all all the fields overlaid. Some of those hedgerows have probably been there for five hundred years. Mm. And if there's a hedgerow there, and it's a hedgerow there now, it I I, I know I've got it lined up right. Yeah. And uh, I I got the um, uh, the building plans from the Air Ministry mm -hmm. at the RAF Museum at Hendon. Right. Using stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I I've um, well I've done research at the um, uh, of course, the National Archives, uh, College Park, Maryland, and Q, um, uh, the Air Force Historical uh, Research Agency at uh, Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama, uh, the National Personnel Center in St. Louis, Missouri, and I have the tables of organization, uh, which uh, I, I, I collected all of the versions of them. Mm -hmm. And um, it came as quite a shock to find out that they were, you know, not what they really did. <laughs> Gosh, so do you have, do you have a way, I mean, obviously it's, it's a bit of a labor of love. So do you have a website, um, you know, if, if someone comes across, you know, the, the, the webinar later on down the line and they've got information they can send on to you, how do they get in touch with you? That's a really good idea, Claire. <laughs> Maybe I need to help you with that. <laughs> Stand by. <laughs> contact Claire. <laughs> and get your contact details. There you go. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, the, the, I mean, if you're watching this later on, on YouTube, um, you know, my, my details are in, going to be in the, the contact box anyway, so get in touch and I can always pass you on to Dave okay, as well. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so Nick has actually said, visited Param a year ago for the first time. It won't be the last. They've made an excellent museum of the field. No, noteworthy for me is that, as that the hardcore for the runway allegedly came from the ruined buildings of Coventry following its bombing in November 40. I didn't realize that. Gosh, that's interesting. Yeah, well, as, as I understand it, it actually uh, it, it came from all of the major metropolitan areas. A lot of it did come from London, I know, well, for this. Well, I've been told. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, and he says, yeah, he said it was a fascinating visit and the model really did help put some clarity and, uh, into it. So well done and thank you, David, he said. Thank you. <laughs> That's interesting. It's interesting how you know they take that rubble from you know some of the cities that were bombed and 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 make use of it. It really is. In fact, I've actually, believe it or not, in the cupboard got a a stone from the Houses of Parliament that that was bombed during World War Two. Mm. Um, and what they did was they put a little crest in it and it says on it, this stone came from the Houses of Parliament. And my grand's aunt was a nurse at the time and was working in London and bought one of them and, and brought it up the road. 
and they had it engraved um, and put on her mother's grave. And then after a few years, I think the family thought we shouldn't really be leaving this on the family grave. Someone will just come along and take it because of what it is. So it's quite funny now that I can say I've got a gravestone <laughs> sitting in my cupboard. <laughs> but it's actually not a gravestone, it's a stone from the Houses of Parliament. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, so yeah, Maureen saying thank you very much, Dave, very interesting. Yeah, if anyone has any other questions, they can put them into the chat box or if you want to unmute, you can ask them directly. Okay, Zana says there was a slide where David said he may share his thoughts later. I'm not sure um, his thought. Oh, yeah, you did say that. He said there was a slide that you would share your thoughts at the end. Mm. Mm. Well, I think it was that things weren't always great. Um, there, I have the daily records of the, uh, the military police company. And there were acts that uh, nobody should be proud of. And um, it's, um, there were some uh, uh, inappropriate relationships. There was uh, uh, vandalism and theft and uh, right now I live about a mile from a college campus so uh, I I encounter these kinds of you know the misbehavior uh, it's different music but it's the same spirit yeah. and uh, uh, that darned executive functioning just yeah um but i'm still i'm still amazed at how well it all managed to work yeah i mean there there are planes that went down because people made foolish errors uh, there were uh, crimes because people didn't think about the consequences but that shouldn't that shouldn't negate the amazing cooperation, flexibility, ingenuity, and dedication to do the job. And they did the job. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I, I know that um, the job of necessity was terrible. Mm. That we were going to come in we were we were arrogant okay uh, americans still are arrogant but um we were going to just wipe out the bad guys building we were not going to hurt people and that deteriorated uh, when the reality met the arrogance and um uh, uh, and some look down on bomber command because they say, well, we weren't doing precision daylight bombing. Well, when you see marshalling yard or secondary target of any German city, um, it's the same thing, except it's lit up. Um, yeah, I, I'm laughing. It was actually one of the things that I, I wrote about when I was doing my World War II course. Um, because it was, you know, it was just phrased in a different way to make it appear to be different, but in theory, it was the same. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you're using primitive electronics uh, to determine where a town is through clouds, how is that any different than looking for a bend at the river at night mm -hmm. and letting go? Yeah. Um, and we did incendiaries. One of one of the fifteen or sixteen organizations is a chemical company, 
and they were prepared to to gas the enemy but primarily what they did is they handled the smoke bombs and the incendiaries that's that's what a chemical company does um so um yeah I, this is the, the the lessons that come out of this is the flexibility ingenuity and cooperative uh, that's what i want to take from this is that no you don't need computers no you don't need to do any of this stuff uh you just need to come at it with the attitude of we're going to make this work and so if you can convince somebody of the why then you can do anything yeah well thank you so much for your presentation david it's been really interesting i mean certainly you know i know myself and, and i'm sure some of the people watching in fact i know some of the people watching are more clued up about the bomber command you know the allied bomber command side of things it's really interesting to hear a bit more about the american side yeah as i understand it the base was designed for 1500 people we have we had 3000 there so pretty cramped i think i would think so yes yeah yeah gosh um so thank you so much it's been really thank interesting you. um and if, if anyone wants to get in touch with dave um certainly you know drop me a, a message i'll put my details into the chat box in a minute are you hanging about for john sweetman's interview Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So what I'll do, um, I'll just play that for everyone. You're going to really enjoy this one. I just couldn't believe the people that John has actually spoken to me and that he could actually remember the Dam Busters raid. You know, I totally was in awe of this man. Um, so um, I'm going to share it. If, Dave, if you can just let me know if I'm mute, I'm just hoping that you'll still be able to hear the recording. Okay. If you can, you can maybe let me know. Right, you should be able to see that now, just a blank screen. Hi everyone, and I have John Sweetman with me today, who's here to speak about his book, The Dam Busters, What Is It Worth? Hi John, how are you? Well, the, the actually the title is "Was it worthwhile?" Oh, is it? The, all right. The, the the picture that I or the header that I got from Pen and Sword actually said, "The Dambusters was it worth it?" Ah, yes, but uh, like uh, we've changed that. Ah, it's that now was, that was the original press release I was sent. Yeah, yeah. was it worthwhile? Ah, and that's based upon a question by Barnes Wallace himself. Okay. In 1972, he wrote to Dr. Dick Collins, who was the uh, scientist responsible for the model test before the dams raid, and posed that question to him. It, 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 the context was that he was always regretted, he always regretted that 53 people lost their lives as the result of his uh, experiment. To him, it was an experiment. He was a scientist. Yeah, the, he uh, saw the problem. Response the problem the was model to knock down the, the dams, dams. and he and posed that, didn't really recognize that in doing so, people would risk their lives. So all his life, he regretted that, and uh, he said to me once, "I don't want to talk about it," because he was. But but of course, you have to take it in a much wider context. Yeah. Uh, was it worthwhile well, i'll come back well you asked me how i got into this yeah well i'm of an age that actually remembers the raid itself well no uh, uh, and uh i was i can't think work out i was i was what was i i was about i was eight at the time God. and the interesting thing about it was that the thing i remember about it was vaguely about the reports of the raid but also, I lived in a village called Soberton Heath. Yeah. It was a pond at the top of a hill there, curiously enough, between the district nurse's house and the local Methodist chapel. You might say that's a, a right spot to be. Because we used to climb a tree and act out a bomber crew. 
So we took the different positions and I remember clearly for the Downbusters raid, I was the bomber aimer, but actually it was out over the pond and dropped stones into the pond. At time, of course, we didn't know it bounced. We didn't know it was well. We just thought it was a bomb dropping into the water. So many years later, um, when I was not very well, I had a long illness, I started reading books about the Dambusters and I read uh, Enemy Coast Ahead by Guy Gibson and also um, the book by Paul Brickhill called The Dambusters, which frankly was based heavily upon the Dambusters raid part was based heavily upon uh, Gibson's and in fact many years later I met Gibson's uh, widow and she said that she actually sued Brickhill by that time he was in for plagiarism but in fact he was by that time he was in Australia and she never got the money I don't know how true that is but what I'm saying is that I realized that there had no be no original research done about it at that stage now we're talking in the mid-1960s now and that stage you couldn't get at the public records yeah. for 50 years then suddenly they were open and you could get at them after 30 years so I was very lucky in the late 1960s to be able to get into the public record office uh, uh, what was then in, in Q, uh, well it's Q now isn't it I think it was then still in London yeah. And I read the, all the records there, so I was able to look at the accounts that had been written, which were, of course, in the first person, and they couldn't possibly have been uh, accurate. And that allowed me to get at the actual records, the public records, and the actual uh, records of the, of the time. Mm -hmm. That led me on to think, well, if I've got the records, I need to talk to the people. Yeah. I'm very, very lucky because at the time I was working on the academic staff at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, which gave me an entree. And as a result of that, I was able to meet Barnes Wallace and spend hours in his, in, in his house at Effingham and became very friendly with him. So he allowed me to look at all his records, which he had taken uh, when he retired from Brooklands. And I spent hours doing that he also introduced me to the scientist who I mentioned just now, Dick Collins, who was the Rogue Research Laboratory, and he'd carried out the model tests. And he, I spent hours with him and he looked at the text and he corrected it and so on. So from the point of view of the people who were closely connected with the development of the raid, I had immediate personal access to Barnes Wallace and to Dick Collins, and that was invaluable. Yeah. Through a military contact, I was able then be able to interview Sir Arthur Harris, who was CNC Bomber Command, and more importantly, perhaps, Five Group Commander, Sir Rafe Cochrane, who was immediately responsible for launching the raid through 617 Squadron Association. Okay. Um, that led me on to uh, meeting uh, originally the Secretary of the Association, Squadron Leader Tony Iverson, who didn't fly on the dams raid, but flew on the turpits raids later. And through him, I got access to a large number of the um, people who flew on the raid, including importantly, one of the three survivors. Um, two of them, unfortunately, uh, well, one I think uh, was in Australia then, I did get in contact with him. One I think had died, the Canadian, and Fred Tease, who was um, a, a rear gunner, in one of the uh, planes which got shot down um, on the way to the dam and I was able to talk to him and get a first-hand account obviously from him not only of what happened to him but to correct uh, an error in all the records. All the records suggested he was in the front turret that night, he was actually in the rear turret and I've got a letter to that effect where he actually confirms he was in the rear turret. Yeah. So uh, something that started really as an interest became almost an obsession um, and uh, uh, so therefore I wrote originally about it in 1972 but 
then in as uh, time goes by i've met more people and had more contacts i met for example leonard cheshire and so on who talked about it and that meant over the years i've acquired lots lots more information which i didn't publish in 1982 and so um pns uh, uh, pen and sword i should say uh, came up with the idea that i should actually write the account again based upon what they said so initially the uh, title was in their own words and that appears i think in a subtitle uh, um, on the, on the book as well it's was it worthwhile taking um, wallace's uh, question to uh, dick collins but also um, taking into account the various criticisms that have been leveled at the operation in the years that gone past for example that it wasn't it didn't achieve what it said it was going to achieve all it did was kill 400 slave laborers so i've attacked i've, I've attacked that and looked at that and built upon the, uh, uh, my answer to that has been built upon interviewing this person who was director of bomber operations at the air ministry at the time so bufton and he went through that with me in quite great detail so that so i'm able i hope to at least examine that in a balanced way yeah and also there is the fact that it wasn't worthwhile because it didn't achieve anything other than a few little passing damage but one of the important elements is that it had a long-term effect on the germans in the sense that they immediately protected 10 of their dams um, and put in place uh, first class troops um, what we would call the home guard yeah. guns um, mines and so on and i calculated that they withdrew from the front the equivalent of a, a division of troops at that time so i think that's, that that that's an important element we should think about yeah but not least was the international impact. Uh, a number of the crews, of course, came from Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and they and uh, uh, and some of them had actually trained in South Africa. One of the uh, bomb aimers had train, uh, trained in South Africa, so there are an awful lot of Commonwealth interest, and that uh, was important that we. Have You've got to remember i'm old i'm afraid i'm old enough to re remember that all we knew was in in the papers that people were uh, bombers were going out night after night and bombing different cities and we had headlines like dewsburg shattered thousand bomber raid yeah. and all you had was photographs of sort of burning buildings and so on now this operation had specific uh, photographs showing before and after they were dramatic yeah and so that therefore had a dramatic effect upon morale in this country undoubtedly dick collins argued that it also in, improved the or enhanced the reputation of the scientists of this country the very fact that we could develop something that could achieve this and i talked to a um a, an intelligence officer called Eddie, Eddie Pine, who I actually knew him in later years, and he was an intelligence officer at that time, and he said his words were, we did need it. In other words, it was important for morale in this country, it was important for the support of the Commonwealth, but most importantly, perhaps of all, it got the support of the Americans at, uh, at a time when the Americans were wavering about support uh, committing themselves to europe rather than far east and it so happened there was a combined chiefs of staff meeting in New america at that time in which it was taken on board and uh, the uh, chief of the, the chief of the joint chiefs of staff in america congratulated uh, boba harris and in its wake churchill made a combined a speech to the combined houses of congress in which he emphasized what had been achieved through this and also took the opportunity to, to commit the raf to supporting the americans even if the war in europe finished before that against japan yeah 
So what researching the book, what was the most interesting thing that you discovered? Well, I didn't mention that I actually travelled to Germany to interview Albert Speer, oh, wow. the, uh, the German minister responsible at the time. Mm. And what was interesting for me was he was called out of bed at three o'clock in the morning by a phone call from uh, uh, the uh, uh, German air ministry and told to get his backside over the dams rapidly. And he got over there and he flew in a, a Fiesler store which is a, a small communication aircraft and he flew over and landed at an airfield called Vell, which was very close to the Myrna Dam. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to talk to him about what his reaction was when he saw what was happening there, then went on to the Zorpa Dam and made, as a result of that, he made recommendations about the, the guns being, support, uh, being protecting the dams and reported directly to Hitler when he got back and said that Hitler was very impressed by it. The interesting thing that he then discussed with me in, was the effect that it had on Hitler's um, view of the Luftwaffe, because he felt that it, they, it, the Luftwaffe had let them down and letting these, as one of the, the generals said, these few crates uh, to go into Germany and uh, actually devastate the dams. There were only 19 of them went in there, mm -hmm. 16 of which attacked, eight were shot down, three turned back for various reasons. So we're talking about uh, 16 aircraft attacking that, those dams. And uh, as um, I think, I can't remember who it was, one of the German academics later said that it did more, more achieved more that night than the Thousand Bomber Raid. Right. So it, uh, the important thing I think to, to recognize too is the accuracy. Up until that stage, you had was essentially what was called area bombing. Or, yeah. And but on the back of that, Rafe Cochran wrote in five group news to in, impress on people that if this could be done by 617 Squadron, many four squadrons should aim at more accuracy to win the war as you put it yeah yeah well, that's really interesting it must have been um quite an interesting interview i would imagine well the, the interesting too with with spear was that of course i after i talked about dam busters i went uh, i went sort of more broadly on and, and on on his attitude and so on and so forth and he of course People uh, will know that he was convicted at uh, Nuremberg and in prison for 20 years. But he basically put his hands up and said, not me, Gav, I didn't know anything about it. Which was not, I was not, I'm not, I was not impressed with, and neither were the judges at, at Nuremberg. Yeah. But it was interesting to talk to him and two very small things, which you can cut out this, if you like. Um, as I was sitting in his house in Heidelberg, just the other side of the river, it was on the uh, high side of a river. The other side of the river, as we sat there looking out of the window uh, talking, there was fork lightning. And I can I remember of the uh, um, uh, name's gone for me now. Um, oh, Wagner. If you, if you guess, that reminded me of Wagner and the Hitler's obsession with Wagner. Mm -hmm. Then before I'd gone uh, to see Spear, obviously I re read all his books and I'd read up a, a, a lot of what he'd written. And he talked about being at the Berchtesgau garden, which was Hitler's lair, yeah. where at four o'clock in the afternoon, Eva Brown came out with coffee and cakes, which was a German tradition. At four o'clock in the afternoon, there was a knock on the door and I had a double tape. Was Eva Brown coming in? It was Frau Speer came in with coffee and cakes. Uh, I know that's something you can cut out, but it's something you might be inter but interested in me. No, so I'm sure everyone would be interesting to hear that. That's really interesting, though. That I mean, it just sort of takes you to that that moment in time hearing these stories. Well, I think the important thing I tried to make out a say in this book is it's it's easy to look back on history. Yeah. I've always, I've always had in mind a remark by Field Marshal Singh. 
I'm always, uh, uh, sorry, let's get this right. Um, I can think of the word now. Oh, damn it. Hang on. Um, I'm always suspicious of generals who said their battles went according to plan. Yeah. Mine, ne mine never did. <laughs> and so to look back and pick holes in an operation from a, a distance, not, uh, not taking into account the navigational aids they had, for example, yeah. and, uh, and the way that they planned this operation is, I think, it, yes, it wasn't a perfect operation, um, I think that they didn't, the planners didn't understand the true importance of the Zorpe Dam, which is the one which was not like the Myrna. So they, they, it was had a central concrete core supported by earth supports and was unlike the, so the gravity dams or the other dams that were attacked. So they didn't really work out a proper way of, of attacking it. Yeah. And that was a flaw. That was definitely a flaw in the planning and you could therefore look back and criticize that but you've got to recognize we've got to recognize these were men in the air ministry under the pressure of war and here comes comes along somebody with uh, what uh harris said to me was lunacy to him was lunacy chopping his bomb uh, across a lake it was absolute nonsense and he wasn't prepared to commit a large number of people to it. Looking back, you could argue that there are too few aircraft were actually committed to that operation that night. Yeah. There were, after all, six dams that were on the attack list, not the, not the two we know and the third that was attacked. Um, so you, 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 you've got to recognize the conditions at that time. And so one of the points I try to make during, in the book is you've got to put it in the context and you've got to think back into the time yeah. and say, was it worthwhile in the context of the time in terms of uh, military achievement, the aim to, uh, to in, in, um, the aim to destroy the major industrial capacity of the Ruhr? It clearly didn't do that. But it did have more effect than people uh, have, have, have recognized in times gone past but it has the important effect on morale at home and also on the international scene as well i, I forgot to mention that uh, stalin sent uh, a, a, a letter of congratulations and much later we used the information about the downbusters raid to get some kudos from the uh, Russians who wanted details of it and it was le leaked out to them or fed to them in stages at about September of that, later that year. Yeah. I mean I, I just think you know it is what it is and it's you know I suppose there was mistakes made there was they could have done things a bit differently but it was a feat it really was i mean but it was an extraordinary feat at it the was time. um uh, writing to I, I think it was to wallace i can't remember who it was but group captain Whit whitworth who was the um a station commander at scampton during this operation and therefore was gibson's immediate superior mm -hmm. he reported to him on all the training so a lot of the correspondence was him writing in 1946 i'm pretty certain it's to wallace uh, saying that this in his view was the most in, uh, most outstanding single ec at, at episode of the war mm -hmm. now that's maybe an exaggeration and i think it is but nevertheless it was significant very significant at the time yeah i yeah. think that's the 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 message i'd like to leave mm -hmm. really yeah and i mean as you say as well there's the whole um for the public you know for i mean we saw on the newspapers it was all over the newspapers at the time it was that sense of building morale for the public that that we were doing something you know positive about well, what's happening you've you've got to recognize we are in 1943 mm. the russian advance uh, after Stalingrad has not started. Yeah. 
the um, Japanese have taken Singapore and are advancing on India. Mm -hmm. And it's not until 1944, but curiously enough, my father-in-law was part of the defense of India in one of the big battles. Yeah. There. Um, uh, and there are two called Kohima and Infal in 1914, uh, 1944, and Frank was at Kohima. So that's coming forward. We've only just uh, uh, liberated uh, uh, North Africa. We haven't yet invaded Italy, and there's no, we haven't invaded the mainland Europe. Yeah. So for people in this country, and I have to say, my, my brother was in the Navy and my uncle was in the Navy. We were worried about, there were people worried about their relatives who were serving. Yeah. And there's also still, you've got, we've got to recognize that people talk about the Battle of Britain. Bombing of this country went on after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, and, and it went on until... And curiously enough, I picked up one paper which report, reported the Dambusters raid, also reported a raid on London. Yeah. Uh, and so it was still going on right up until 1944. I can remember lone, lone bombers in Portsmouth coming over in 1944. I think, I think that's it because there's so much um, spoken about the Battle of Britain that people, you know, people nowadays that, that didn't experience or, or hear stories tend to think that was the only time that Britain was actually bombed and, and, and the reality was it was far from that, it, you know, it carried on throughout the war. Well, don't forget the, the, the V weapons. Yeah, exactly. You, you, you talk about uh, people talk about uh, aircraft, that's fair enough, but it's the V1s and V2s, yeah. um, which came from nowhere. Yeah, in, um, fact, in fact, my great uncle was involved in the bombing of the, the V1 weapons site. Oh, really? Yeah, so it was something that I've actually looked into a bit, which I thought was, you know, and I think that was actually one of the first raids that they were sort of told um, that, that they were to try and destroy the village where all the scientists and all that were. So it was more aimed at life, you know, where before that it was actually about taking out industry and, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, totally different. Yeah, and you can understand, you know, the damage that, that, that they were going to be doing. So oh, the I, reasons I, behind that were understandable. The, v, yeah, the V2s yeah. here, yeah. here, whereas those V1s, and I can I saw, once saw a V1. I oh, did you? Yeah. Um, and this was in 1940. Well, it didn't start until June 1944. Yeah. And uh, I... I was in Portsmouth at my grandmother's house and there was a public house called the Good Companion. I remember that for some reason or other, just at the end of the road. And this V1, which was completely off course, it was supposed to be going towards London, had come off course and came from, from the right, as it were, from the east. And it stopped popping, it stopped popping over, over the pub. So we knew that it wasn't going to crash on us. Mm -hmm. it, it glided for one and a quarter miles after that and it was within 200 yards or 300 yards of getting into the harbour in Portsmouth that hit a road called New Common Road and destroyed lots of houses there yeah. and that's the only one I saw it but, but you you know it was terrifying and so to, to think that the, uh, the the air threat to this country finished at, in, at the end of the Battle of Britain is a myth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, when is the book out? I think it's coming out for the 80th anniversary, which is in May. Okay. That's, uh, that's the idea. But the, the, the original, that was the original uh, handout, which I objected to because that was silly. Doesn't mean anything. You look at that title, was it worth it? Was what worth what? Mm -hmm. It's nonsense. And so in, in the end, they've agreed. And I, well, I don't, you, you can't see it, can you? Can you see that? No, up a bit. You got it? No, bring it up a bit. No, up further, up further. Up towards your eyes. Oh, up, up there? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yep. Was the read worthwhile? And you see on the back there, it's yeah. attributed to Wallace. Yeah. And that uh, uh, that breach on the back pages of the Ada Dam, and I objected. I didn't like that. The, the front page is, is old hat, but they wouldn't have it. I said, 
I've got a lovely photograph, lovely photograph, that's, that's not right, but a photograph of, um, sorry, I put my hands up there. I shouldn't do that. Right. Um, uh, I've got a photograph of the, from an angle underneath taken by the Germans of the Myrna Dam showing the cross section of it and the fact that they'd put artificial trees on the top of the dam to try to disguise it. Right. And uh, that we picked that up very quickly. Well, we didn't pick it up quickly. The uh, uh, reconnaissance aircraft did pick up photographs and saw uh, with the sun behind them, they looked as if they were guns because the they reflected on the water. Right. And it took the uh, researchers at RAF Medmum to work out that the, that was what it was. It was a reflection of artificial trees rather than, uh, than guns. So they did a fascinating job, really, didn't they? Oh, they did. I mean, it, it was all that information together and trying to work out what they were seeing. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And of course, the interesting thing is that, that uh, Wallace and, and uh, Collins, both of them independently said to me that they relied on the uh, interpreters to interpret what there was. Yeah. Um, the, the dam, the dam, uh, the model dams were built partly on, on, on uh, well, they, they were actually on diagrams from books taken out, but they were actually confirmed by uh, PR, uh, um, PRU, Photographic Reconnaissance Work. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, sorry, it's just a, to me, as a story, it's, uh, it's fascinating, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. No, it sounds really, really interesting, and I couldn't think of a more appropriate time for the book to be released, really. Well, I hope, well, what I think is important is that it's Wallace is posing the question. Yeah. Posing the question because he regrets having been responsible for losing 53 lives. Yeah. Of course, the whole thing is much further than that, much wider than that. And there's been much, much criticism of late, of course, there have been one or two books that have come out recently, which have criticised it. And I, I think it, it's appropriate to not say it was perfect. It certainly was not perfect in, in concept or in, in, in execution. But at the time and in the context of the time, it was out, outstanding. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today, John. It's been really interesting and I really mm -hmm. look forward to reading your book when it comes out in May. I will share details of where you can buy it via the Pen and Sword website. Thank you so much, John. Let me just catch up with the um, chat. Uh, a couple of people dropped out, that's okay. Um, Alan said that he thoroughly enjoyed the book Bobber Crew Taking on the Reich. Um, and it's such a pleasure to see you deliver the presentation tonight. Incredible that you met so many high profile players and researching a Dan Buster's book. Thank you for such an interesting talk and good luck with the new book. It really um, was fascinating. Um, talking to um john he's, he's just met so many interesting people um i mean i think actually it was the first time that he'd actually he'd actually used zoom he had to get one of his, his grandchildren or something like that to actually show him how to do it um so yeah i mean it was really nice it was really nice of him to, to take part in that um <clears throat> let me just put a, a link into the chat box of where you can purchase Patrice's book. Not too many windows open. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was Roger. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, yeah, you can pre-order John's book and I actually noticed, I think there's five pounds off it at the moment. Um, so I would get in and get it ordered just now and, and get some money off it as well. Um, 
just before we wrap up, um, we are always happy to collaborate at Allied Air Force Research. So if you have a story to share, or you work on a project, or there's something that you want to share with our audience, or even a guest blog article, or you're publishing a book, um, get in touch. Uh, I, I, have, I have popped details of where to contact us into the chat box. So we're always happy to hear from you. Um, if you're struggling with your own research, feel free to reach out via the website as well. Our next webinar will be on Wednesday the 31st of May at 7pm when the speaker will be Andy Bird, who will provide a presentation titled Operation Black Buck 1982, the Vulcan's Extraordinary Falcon Falklands War Raids. Andy is a historian and a writer and he's also the author of several histories on RAF maritime operations, including most recently Heroes of Coastal Command. He's also presented in research for television programmes um, on the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Forces News and Sky History, to name a few. He served with the RAF uh, Reserves whilst working as an accomplished graphic designer and as an exhibition designer at the RAF Museum in London. Um, next month, we also have a short interview with Dilip Sarkar in relation to his book, The Battle of Britain on the big screen. You can sign up for this now and I have placed details into the chat box so if you want to quickly grab that now you'll be able to register and what I'll do is I usually just give you a quick reminder at that morning um, so that you know that the event's taking part so you don't need to bother marking it in your diary just if you forget about it. Um, so I'll give you, I'll just turn the camera off now and um, let you capture anything that you want from the chat box. Um, I'd like to thank uh, John Sweetman for his interview, but particularly to Dave for a really interesting presentation. Um, thank you so much, Dave. It really was appreciated. Um, and I hope to catch up with you all soon. Take care.